Hello, everyone joining. We're going to get started in about a minute. Um, you can drop us a message in the chat, say hello. Um, and if you have any questions in the chat or in the Q&A, I will get them to them. I hopefully won't uh, interrupt Ferros too much. Ferros already messed it up. Um, <laughs> Cool, yeah, I'm excited to do this. Um, Luke, if you could read the, when there's questions, if you could just read them to me, because um, right now I'm full screened and uh, okay. I can't see any chat messages. Cool. All righty. So it looks like we got a good amount of people in here. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, you are at a log rocket meet up and we've got a really awesome topic today that we don't cover a lot or enough of and i think the whole community doesn't spend nearly enough time on and i know i don't um so yeah we've got for us a book a book of dj close maybe not you got um, it you got it you nailed it boom sweet um and yeah he recently started you know a company around this um raised some money i saw too so congrats um, but yeah, today we're going to go through understanding JavaScript supply chain security. Um, so yeah, really pumped. And um, before I pass it over, just wanted to quickly shout out this meetup's brought to you by LogRocket. And if you've never tried the product, LogRocket's a front-end application monitoring solution and product analytics solution to help you better understand users, fix issues more quickly, and really proactively ship better experiences in your web apps. Um, so pretty removed from the uh, security space, um, but what's nice about LogRocket is, you know, if all of these uh, malicious JavaScript packages are completely destroying, uh, you know, maybe they're loading some like crypto miners onto users' browsers, you'd actually go see that in little, you know, spikes of average CPU usage, for instance, and we're looking at LogRocket at the front monitoring dashboard. So that is one way you could actually go see like, hey, if I've got a bunch of, um, packages that are that are really kind of destroying performance. Uh, so maybe not maliciously. Um, you know, you can use LogRocket to proactively monitor stuff like front end performance if users are really unhappy, uh, if your application is just not working correctly. So with that, I'll shut up. Take it away. Cool. Thanks, Luke. That was a, was a good intro. And um, for everyone um, here, thanks for joining. Um, we're, we have a really cool topic. Uh, we're going to talk all about JavaScript supply chain security. Um, and for those who don't know, um, supply chain security or supply chain, this concept is really just about where do our dependencies come from. Um, and um, you know, by the end of this talk, hopefully you'll understand um, all about um, kind of the risks and, um, and uh, the opportunities uh, to, to improve supply chain security in your app. Um, so uh, let's get started. Uh, first, I'll just tell you a little bit about me really quick. Oh, you're not uh, so sharing I'm your the, screen. That... Sorry to interrupt. Oh, uh-oh. Okay. Let me fix that. Okay, there we go. Perfect. How am I doing now? Perfect. Okay, cool. Cool, so uh, a little bit about me. So my name is Faraz and I'm the founder and CEO of Socket. Uh, you can check that out at socket.dev. And uh, this is a company that is uh, a platform that helps you um, secure your, your JavaScript application from uh, you know malicious dependencies and supply chain attacks, which we're going to talk about and learn about in this talk. Um, I'm also an instructor uh, at Stanford for the web security class, uh, and uh, the, all the class, all the all the talks and uh, slides for that are online at uh, cs253.stanford.edu. If you're interested in uh, learning about web security, there's a lot of good um, material there. Um, I'm also the author of a bunch of NPM packages, including uh, two you may have heard of, uh, one called Standard JS, which is a community um, kind of style guide slash code linter tool uh, and WebTorrent, which is the first BitTorrent client that works in the web browser, um, uses WebRTC and a bunch of other cool uh, cool tech. Uh, in the past, I was a board member of the Node Foundation uh, uh, and then also a consultant for the Silicon Valley TV show for for uh, one episode, which was uh, pretty pretty awesome, actually. They, they flew me to LA and I got to um, help, uh, help give input on uh, one of the episodes they were working on, which was super fun. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a bit about me. Uh, let's get started. So the, uh, the agenda for today is we're going to cover four things. Um, first, I'm going to start with a story of a 
supply chain attack. And we're going to dig into some attack code and actually take a look at what does a real attack look like. Uh, then we'll talk about why is this happening now? So why are supply chain attacks on the rise? Um, uh, then we're going to talk about kind of how does an attack work uh, mechanically? Like what are sort of the techniques that, that uh, folks are using? Uh, again, looking at real attack code. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk about how you can protect your app. And, um, you know, we have, uh, you know, a lot of ideas here, um, uh, things you can actually do and take away from this talk that will make your app more secure. Uh, and, um, you know, and, and then there's also some open problems too. So this is really not a, a completely solved problem yet. Although I do think, you know, uh, you will leave with some pretty good advice uh, at the end of this talk. So um, let's start. So let me tell you a story. Uh, so uh, on January 31st, uh, 2012, uh, Faisal Salman uh, published um, the first uh, commit that you can see here on the screen of a package called UA Parser JS, which was a user agent string parser. Um, this, uh, you know, library was, um, you know, uh, initially pretty small and pretty humble, but it grew over the years. Um, after 10 years of steady work and over 50 releases, the package um, became, you know, pretty, pretty widely used in the node world. Um, uh, and uh, eventually getting up to 7 million downloads per week and the 3 million GitHub repos depending upon it. Um, and so this, this package is pretty useful. You know, it helps you parse those user agent strings and, um, and, and you know, the community, um, you know, pretty much adopted it as the go-to solution for this problem. Um, uh, now, let me tell you a different story. So uh, on uh, October 5th, 2021, on a notorious Russian hacking forum, uh, this post was uh, published by um, an, you know by an anonymous uh, poster um, and you can see here they were uh, selling an npm account that had more than seven million downloads every week and um, you know if, if that number sounds familiar uh, it might you know it's 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 because it's the same package that I mentioned earlier so it's you know it, it, it were selling the account to that uh, to, to, to that maintainers um, you know uh, npm account so and you can see here the cost was 20k for for a sort of a buy it now price uh, for this uh, for this account access and so um, you know, we don't know for sure that um, this post uh, led to UA Parser JS getting uh, compromised, but um, this happened um, basically two weeks before um, the package was taken over. And so, what actually happened was on October 22nd, um, three malicious versions of UA Parser JS were published, uh, and um, you know, and you can see the versions here. And so, you know, it's probably the case that these two events are, are connected, although we don't have absolute um, certainty, um, but. Um, let's actually dive in now and take a look at one of these uh, vulnerable versions. So um, this is the package.json file for um, one of the compromised versions. And um, if you look here, I'll, I'll just highlight uh, the line here, the pre-install script. So this is a, um, a feature of NPM that allows the package publisher to uh, ask NPM to run a shell script anytime this package is installed. And so what this means is this malicious version here is actually running uh, running this command anytime someone installs UA parser JS uh, at this version, uh, and um, I'll just point out a few things about it. So first thing is you know it's running it's 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 running the code inside preinstall.js. Um, the second thing is you know you see the slash b flag here, and what that does is on Windows it actually uh, makes the um, uh, the program spawn in a, an invisible terminal, which makes it a little bit sneakier and a little bit harder to detect that something is go is going on here. Now let's actually open up this file and see what's going on inside. So if you open up the file, uh, the first thing you'll notice is that there is um, a set of cases here where different things happen on each platform. So uh, on Mac, you'll see here that this variable gets set to Mac OS and then pretty much nothing else happens. So Mac users are pretty lucky here in that they pretty much nothing happens. So the, the attacker was, was too lazy to make uh, their malware actually do something on, on Mac, Mac. So it's total, total uh, luck for, for Mac users there. But on Windows, they weren't so lucky, and uh, this uh, preinstall.bat file is going to get spawned. And on Linux, uh, something similar happens. So this function here is called, which just calls exec on preinstall.sh. So now let's open up preinstall.sh and take a look at what's what's going to happen here. So the first thing you'll notice is this uh, this first line where uh, the, the attacker is curling this URL and getting back the results and um, grepping for particular country codes. And so what this is doing is it's doing a, a GOIP lookup on the user's IP address and trying to determine what country they're coming from. And if they're coming from any of the four in this list, which are Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, or Kazakhstan, then uh, this um, the script will terminate. It will just exit early and it won't do anything else. Um, so this is kind of strange. And you might be asking yourself, why would why would a piece of code, you know, why would an attacker do this? 
Um, and this is actually something that's pretty common in malware. So um, usually the, the malware author doesn't want to antagonize their local uh, law enforcement um, in the, you know, the country where they live or where their, you know, their team members live. And so it's probably the case that they're coming from one of these countries um, or, or um, they have associates in, 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 in some of these countries. And so they're trying to not attack people in those countries. Um, but for people in other countries, not so lucky. And this script will continue um, executing here. So the next thing it does is it, it looks for any running processes with the name JS extension. And this just happens to be the name of the malware. And they use the pgrep program, which, which will search running processes and tell you if any of them match uh, the name that you, that you pass in here. So if the malware is already running, then this, exe this uh, exits early and nothing else happens. Otherwise, it's going to download the malware and um, get, it, get it running. So here you can see it downloads it. Uh, it makes it executable with chmod, and then finally it, it uh, runs it. And if you look at the arguments here, you can probably guess what this is doing. Um, you can see one of the arguments is uh, the URL to minexmr.com. And for those who don't know, XMR is um, Monero, uh, the Monero cryptocurrency. So this is basically uh, running a cryptocurrency miner uh, and mining uh, crypto for the for the attacker uh, using your um, you know your system resources or your production server um, you know resources here. So that's what, that's what that file does. Now let's take a look at the Windows uh, file, so the, 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 the bat file. Um, so it's very similar. It starts off with the, you know, downloading the JS extension.exe file, but then it does one extra thing. And you can see it here. So it's, it's actually downloading a DLL file, um, which is um, kind of a Windows specific uh, thing, uh, which is like a linked library file. And um, I'll just point out one kind of interesting thing here. So you can see that it's using curl. Uh, and then if curl doesn't exist, then it attempts to use wget because um, I guess sometimes curl is not present on Windows. Uh, and then finally, if wget doesn't exist, then it uses this thing called certutil.exe. And this is actually a tool for, for um, validating and signing certificates, but apparently it also has the ability to download URLs. Uh, and so you can actually use it as curl or wget, which is pretty hilarious. Um, and so uh, if, you know, if, if all else fails, we use uh, the attacker uses certutil.exe to, to try to download a file. Um, good fun. Um, so now we have the now the attacker has the DLL file here, and so what do they do? Um, it's very similar to the other one. They just um, they they execute um, the, the the payload, and then they also register the DLL. And um, what that does on Windows is it steals passwords from hundred different programs, and including the Windows Credential Manager. So it's it it basically looked for for programs like Slack, Discord, um, you know, uh, anything with a with a login, and and just harvested the the login credentials or the tokens and sent them to the attacker. So pretty nasty stuff. And so the aftermath of this was, um, you can see here, the author was apologizing for it on GitHub. And um, it turns out this was actually caught within four hours. So it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty fast. Um, but I will say, you know, the reason why this was caught so quickly is, is probably because it was a pretty noisy attack. Um, you know, it's, it's not very sneaky if you start mining cryptocurrency on people's computers because they, they will notice that their laptop is getting hot uh, and uh, their battery is getting drained. So, you know, this wasn't a, an attack that was designed to be sneaky. And so um, the community found it pretty quickly, got it taken down from NTN. And so it was only live for about four hours. Um, but during those four hours, anyone who happened to install this package, um, update, you know, to the new version or merge a dependabot PR that was updating them to the new version or, um, you know, do a, they did a build during that time and they weren't using a lock file. Um, you know, there's, there's all these different ways that you could have um, been unlucky enough to have installed this, this vulnerable version when it was live. And any of those builds or, or uh, machines that did that um, were compromised. And you have to assume that, you know, um, if it was a Windows machine that the passwords were, um, were stolen. So, um, so not a very a fun place to be. So um, the thing is that this is also just the tip of the iceberg. Um, there's been about 180 packages removed for security reasons in just the last 30 days. So you can actually see a complete listing of these. If you go to the URL at the bottom of the screen there, um, we, we host a, a list of all the removed packages on socket.dev, which is really useful for uh, research purposes. So you can take a look through there and just see kind of what are the attackers doing. It's, it's actually quite interesting. Um, so there's been a few other prominent examples I'll mention that you, you may have heard in the news um, besides the story we already we just went through. So in, in January, uh, there was a, a prominent maintainer of uh, colors and faker packages who added code to the, to the packages to, to create a denial of service um, in protest of big corporations using his open source but not contributing anything back uh, to him. And he, um, you know, he just decided he woke up one morning and was like, I'm going to put you know, bad code in my packages. And, um, you know, and so it's interesting because oftentimes we think of you know, the attacker as someone who's somehow managed to get code into a package. But it can actually be the maintainer in, in some cases, as we, as we saw here. Um, then in March, there was another um, 
prominent incident where the node IPC package added code to delete the data of users that it thought were coming from Russia or Belarus and did this with a GeoIP detection. And then if it thought your IP was coming from one of those countries, then it would basically it looped over every file on your computer and it would overwrite your files with a heart emoji, which is, um, I mean, yeah, it's pretty, it's a pretty, it's a pretty destructive um, bit of code. It's, it's basically an RM dash RF of your, of your hard drive effectively. Um, and of course this affected anyone who was running a VPN or anyone whose IP address happened to geolocate to Russia or one of, you know, one of these, one of those countries. Um, and, um, and of course, um, you know, it affected schools, hospitals, all those other kinds of, 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 of uh, people, people using that code in those countries. So this is definitely crossing the line into malware in my opinion. Um, absolutely. Um, then there's, there's, um, then, then there were a bunch of follow-up kind of incidents that happened in, in the late March and, and April that were similar to this. They were protests, but they were a little bit more, um, let's say measured and uh, more benign in their approach. So the maintainers of several packages actually added um, anti-war messages to their packages that would basically print out as a console log during the installation process, um, which is you know a lot less destructive, um, but probably still unwanted by most users. Um, but um, one of them um, actually um, included, uh, if you included the, if you included event source polyfill, this package in your front end uh, bundle, it would actually um, wait 15 seconds and uh, then redirect or open a pop-up um, to a protest uh, petition website. And so it was actually causing, you know, actually user visible behavior, um, uh, you know, to, to, um, to, to your, your, potentially your visitors, right, to your website. So again, not wanted, it's not wanted behavior by most users of the package. Um, so these are just some recent examples. Um, of course, um, there's, there's many, many more if you go back, um, back and kind of look through all the, all the news stories around, around this. So so one question is like, why is this happening now? Like, why do we see so many of these attacks um, happening today? Uh, and, 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 and what's like, what's going on here? So I think there's four main reasons why we're seeing a lot more uh, attacks. Um, the first is that open source has has won. So just across the board, you know, we're using open source everywhere now. 90% um, of an app's code comes from open source. So, you know, if you look through the lines of code, you're using probably 90% of the lines are coming from open source. And um, you know we do we use open source because it's great. You know it, it it lets us save time. It lets us build something in a day or in a week that would have taken a month or a year in the past. Um, and and of course it lets us you know like stand on the shoulders of giants. So we can use code that was written by people much smarter than ourselves, or people who understand a problem that we don't have time to understand right now. And so we can just use that code. So it's great. Um, so this is but, but but this also comes at the risk obviously. And so we're using code that's written by someone else that we haven't really looked at. Um, so the second reason is really that the way we write software has changed. Um, we have a lot more transitive dependencies than we ever had before. As just one example, um, if you take the Discord application, uh, which is an Electron app, and you open it up, you can look at the number of node packages inside. And at the last count, there were 19,462 packages, um, which is just a mind boggling number. I mean, that's a huge number of, of packages. And then if you look at all the commits in those packages over time, you'll see there's actually been 381,000 contributors to the code. Uh, from 206 countries. So, you know, on the one hand, this is an amazing like testament to how awesome open source is, uh, that, that Discord is built on top of the work of all these people, right? Um, but on the other hand, that's a huge amount of risk, right? That's just a ton of packages. There's a ton of code changing. There's a ton of people who've touched this code. And so, you know, um, if Discord's not careful, you know, this could be a, could be a problem. Uh, and so there's there's a paper that came out um, that discussed this problem, and here's a nice quote from it. Um, Installing an average NPM package introduces an implicit trust on 79 third-party packages and 39 maintainers, creating a surprisingly large attack surface. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of transitive dependencies. What, what, what that means is when you install one package, you end up bringing in, you know, other packages that that, that package depends on, uh, and those come along for the ride. Uh, so this is a cool visualization that the socket team made to kind of help you understand like what's going on, um, you know, with the complexity of these packages and kind of helps you visualize transitive uh, dependencies. So what you're seeing here is um, every gray box is a package and every um, purple box is a file within that package. And what's what's going on in the animation here is we're actually peeling back the layers one at a time. So if you think of your dependencies as a tree where the root of the tree is the, you know, in this case, the root would be Webpack. Then each layer of the tree as you go down is, is uh, you know, gonna tell you like the dependencies of Webpack would be the next layer. And then the next layer below that would be all the dependencies of those dependencies, right? 
And, um, and then again, including the files that are in those dependencies. And so if I rerun this animation here, you can see this is Webpack, this gray box. And we peel away Webpack, we're gonna get all the dependencies within Webpack as well as all the files that are inside. And then if we keep peeling back these layers one at a time, when we, whenever we peel back a package, we see there's more packages inside, there's more files inside, and we can keep going kind of down the tree and see just there's a lot of code going on in just this one dependency that most, most of us are using in most of our web app, websites and web apps today. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool visualization. Okay, so the third reason is that no one really reads the code. Um, I don't know about you, but um, I'm, I definitely have been guilty of this. And so what's going on here is like we're, we're downloading code from the internet written by unknown individuals that we haven't read, that we execute with full permissions on our laptops and servers where we keep our most important data. So this is pretty crazy, right? We're, we're just taking code that's, that we found on the internet and we're just trusting it and we're using it. We're building our whole businesses and our whole web, web, you know, our websites on it. And for the most part, it actually works, which is pretty incredible. And I think it's actually a miracle that it works in some ways. Um, and the thing is, you know, obviously most people are good, but it just takes a few people, right? A few bad apples, a very tiny percentage to, um, you know, to infiltrate the supply chain. And then we have problems. So if any one of those thousands of dependencies that Discord is using goes rogue, uh, or is hijacked or taken over in some way, then, um, you know, then the whole application is compromised. And so, you know, um, that's kind of what we're, you know, what we're trying to solve here. What, what the problem is, is, is it comes from kind of, comes from sort of no one actually kind of like looking at this code and sort of blindly trusting it, right? Um, and I'm not the only one. I, I know I know that probably many of you also um, also you know don't read the code and you know are probably guilty of getting pull requests that looks like this from Dependabot or some other bot that helps you keep your dependencies up to date. And you kind of look at it and you say, "Okay, my test pass. You know, it looks it's probably fine. Let me just click merge, right?" And you probably just merge this. Uh, and the truth is, when you click merge, what you're really doing here is you're you're taking in code that you haven't read, and this dependency has changed. So there's new code. You haven't read it. You don't know what it does, right? It's probably fine, but it might not be. And you're just hitting merge and you're hoping for the best. Uh, and so that's really kind of why this, this is a potentially why this is a problem, right? Is it, that everyone is doing this. And so there's just like a huge kind of juicy, juicy target here for attackers. And the other thing is too, is, is that, you know, even if you tried to read the code, like say you, say you were, you know, you were feeling really, um, uh, you know, uh, ambitious, and you tried to actually say, oh, I'm going to look at the code here, and I'm going to see what are my dependencies doing, you know, I really want to understand. Attackers can actually publish different code to NPM than they do on GitHub. So your GitHub repo has one set of code, and then when you publish to NPM, that can be different. And NPM doesn't actually enforce that the two, um, you know, sets of code are going to be the same. And so you have to be pretty careful when you're actually reading the code that you're reading the NPM code and not just what you find on GitHub, because there's no guarantee that those are the same. So this is actually, um, you know, this makes it hard to really, um, you know, even do an audit, even if you wanted to, right? Because you actually have to go and download the NPM package and then open up the node modules folder and review it there to really be auditing what you're actually running in production. So, um, you know, of course we can rely on uh, Linus's law that says, you know, uh, I don't know if folks have heard this quote, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. Uh, and this is, you know, kind of the idea that like, you know, if enough people look at the code, enough people are, you know, if it's open source and enough people are, are, are kind of looking at it, that eventually, you know, all problems can be caught, you know, all bugs are, are shallow, you know, you can, we can trust the community to kind of, kind of uh, resolve any, any issues, right? And then that, that's, that's true, right? That is true. But um, the thing is, if everybody believes this, then no one is actually going to read the code. And, um, and then malware can actually persist for longer than, than we, um, than we would want it to. And so that's actually what you find if you, if you um, look at the literature, um, there is a um, you know, paper uh, that, that looked into this and found on average a malicious package is available for 209 days before it's publicly reported. So this is a way too long, right? This is, um, you know, I, I would love to say that all, most of these are caught within four hours, like that first example I told you, but a lot of them are, are a lot sneakier and they're in packages that are a lot less um, utilized. And so they're just, there's not as many eyeballs looking at them. And so the malware actually persists for, for hundreds of days before it's found, unfortunately. Um, and so this is really terrifying uh, that malware can live this long on NPM without anyone finding it, in my opinion. Uh, there was another paper that came out just this year that kind of confirmed the same thing. It said 20% of malware persist in package managers for over 400 days and have more than 1,000 downloads before they're taken down. So it's just a mind-boggling amount of time that it's not being caught. 
Okay, so those are the reasons why I think supply chain attacks are happening. And now let's talk about kind of how does a supply chain attack actually work? So what is the attacker gonna do, right? What do they do when they take over a package? How do they take over a package, right? What are they trying to do here? Um, so there's there's six techniques that we're gonna go over. Um, they're called uh, TTPs. That's the kind of the security industry term for um, tactics, techniques, and procedures, which are just kind of the ways that an attacker can take over a package. Um, so we'll talk about each of them in turn. So let's start uh, the first one, hijacked packages. So um, this is the most common thing that you've probably seen news stories about. If you've if you've ever seen a headline about an NPM library being compromised or something bad happening to NPM, it's probably been uh, related to a hijacked package. And um, basically what goes on here is that um, a maintainer may have chosen a weak password. Um, and that's what happened in the case of UA parser JS. Uh, and um, that password is able to be resold on that on that hacking forum as we saw. It could be the maintainer gives access to a malicious actor as an accident. So um, this happens when you know somebody comes along and says, "Hey, I'd like to help maintain this package," and um, you, you know the maintainer adds them, and and then they turn out to be a bad person in the end. Um, the maintainer can themselves become malicious, so they could be good at first and then become malicious, um, as happened in Colors and Faker. Um, the maintainer could also just like use their package to protest. So they could just decide they want to use the package to make it you know make it change its behavior for for protest purposes. Um, they may get malware on their laptops and have their credentials stolen that way, right? They also might not have um, uh, uh, 2FA turned on for their account and NPM doesn't enforce two-factor authentication. So it could be that they just have a weak password and uh, it's guessable or they reused it on another website, right? Um, so these are the reasons that a package can get hijacked. Uh, now let's talk about uh, another uh, TTP. So this is typo squatting. Typo squatting is also super common. It's, it's probably the, you know, maybe the second most common um, uh, attack that, that we see. So um, you know, I, I I don't have an audience here, so I can't actually ask you uh, ask the audience a question. But but if you um, if you were to look at these two names here, just ask yourself um, which of these names do you think is the correct package, and which do you think is the um, attacker package? So if you if you guessed that the uh, second package name is the correct one, is the true one, you would be wrong. It's actually the fake one. So uh, this is very surprising to a lot of people, uh, but basically you need to think of NPM as a wiki where anyone can publish packages you know, under any name. There's no rules. So if a name is available, you can just publish a package at that name. And so that's what attackers are doing. They're picking names that are really close to popular packages and hoping that people will forget and install the wrong package by accident. And if you do that, then you're not running that attacker's code on your computer, right? So that's, that's, that's really bad. Um, so in this in this case, if you open up this you know fake package, what do we find inside? Well, we find an install script, and this means that this code is going to run automatically as soon as you make that typo and you hit enter, you're done, right? You're compromised because you have an install script that means it's going to run immediately, right? Um, there's no chance to correct it. In this case, if you open up that file, this is what you see. So it's a big wall of obfuscated code. Uh, and I can tell you, even though I, I don't know what this code is doing and I haven't bothered to re you know reverse engineer it, this is not something that you want to run on your computer. Um, you can tell that there's something that they're hiding here. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is not fun, uh, not a fun piece of code that you would want to run. Cool. So now let's talk about uh, dependency confusion. So this one is actually quite similar to typo squatting. Uh, this happens when um, a, uh, a, a company is using an internal NPM registry. So they have private packages that are, that are just for their company. And then they uh, pick a name for that package that is uh, you know, it's unique to their company and it's not registered on the public NPM registry. And then what an attacker can do is they can come along and say, um, uh, register the same name on the public NPM registry. And now there's now there's two packages that have the same name. There's one within the company that's private and there's one that's on NPM publicly and they both have the same name. And so what the internal tools should do when they're installing this package is they should prefer the internal version, right? Because that version existed first and it's, it's um, you know, um, it's it's um, you know important that that that's the version that is preferred um, if it if it both exist. But oftentimes tools will do it wrong and they'll actually download the public version of the code. Um, so that just means that an attacker all they have to do to get code running within a company is to find a name that's a name of a private package that's available on npm publicly and register that name, and then they'll have code running inside the company. So very very bad. If you're using internal packages within your company that are private um, that are you know not published to npm publicly, please please please. Make sure that you put them under a namespace that you control, that you where you own the namespace on the public NPM registry, so that attackers can't do this to you. 
Um, and if you go through the list of, of uh, you know, uh, deleted NPM packages, you'll actually find a ton of examples that are probably dependency confusion attacks. So if you see here, these are all names of packages that had malware or, or sketchy code added to them that have names that look like they conflict with internal company uh, packages. Um, and so these, if you just look through here, you can see there's a federal agency, there's an EU um, you know, domain registry manager, there's Palantir, which is a government contractor, DuckDuckGo. So there's a, attackers are really trying to get into these, into these companies by publishing these, these confusing package names. Uh, and there's even more I could go on. I mean, this is just a sampling. There's Wix, Unity, Grubhub, uh, and more. So you know, this is a real, um, a real attack. Um, yeah. Okay. Now let's talk about install scripts. So we already mentioned this one, but I'm just going to quickly uh, uh, mention that most malware is actually found in install scripts. So it's the number one thing that malware wants to do once it, you know, once they get, a, they take over a package. Why would they not want their code to run immediately, right? So, so everybody, all the attackers are pretty much using this, um, this feature. Uh, and uh, that paper I mentioned from this year actually confirmed this. It said they found about 94% of malicious packages used at least one install script. Uh, and again, you know, that's, it's as easy as adding a single line into the package JSON file. So it's, it's, not, it's not a surprise that people are, are, are doing this. Okay. Now, what do they do when they actually get the code running? So one thing they can do is data exfiltration, which means stealing your data. Um, and if I take that same example from before and we, we dig into this specific uh, install script here, you'll notice that um, they're exfiltrating data in a few different ways. So they're, they're actually, the, 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 uh, the vertical bar actually means that these three scripts are gonna run in parallel um, and um, they're gonna attempt to exfiltrate your data in three different ways. So let's look at the first, uh, the first way. The first way is really simple. It's just an HTTP request. So this is standard Node.js Node code. They didn't make any attempts to obfuscate it or hide what they're doing. It's very clear. So there's an HTTP dot request call, and they're sending the HTTP request to this domain name here uh, that ends in pipedream.net, and it's going to you know this IP address, and uh, and then the data that they're sending in that request is process.n, which is the object that contains all of your environment variables in Node. So process.n is just a, is just a, a dictionary or an object that contains the keys and the values of all of your environment variables. That includes things like API tokens, keys, right? all that kind of stuff will be in process.n. So, um, so this is pretty straightforward uh, and, and not sneaky at all. Uh, but then the attackers aren't, aren't content with just using HTTP. They actually want to get more clever because some, some of you have firewalls that prevent HTTP requests from going out. Um, so you might actually block this or you might, it might not go out. And so they have another way that they try to, try to get the data out. And that's to use a DNS resolver, a custom DNS resolver. So what does that mean? Well, when you do a domain name lookup to resolve a domain name and turn it into an IP address, um, you go to a DNS server on the internet and you ask it for you know, um, the IP that goes with a particular domain name. And what they can do here is they can create a custom DNS resolver. So that means they're, they're saying, we wanna use this IP address here that starts with 165 as our DNS lookup uh, server. And then they just do a lookup for a fake domain name, uh, as you can see here. But the domain name that they use is actually the subdomain is the, is the environment variable that they want to steal. And so they loop over all the environment variables and they send them out one at a time um, uh, uh, where the subdomain is, the, you know, is the, the data that they're trying to steal. And so to your operating system, it looks like you're just doing a bunch of DNS lookups. But in fact, the attacker's uh, you know, fake DNS server is going to be sitting out there on the internet and getting those requests and, and, uh, and collecting uh, your environment variables. So it's quite sneaky. And then finally, I'll just mention kind of one of the main things that um, attackers like to do is to destroy data or to ransom the data. And, um, and we'll, um, I'll just show you one like little snippet here because um, we're low on time here, but basically this is that, uh, that node IPC library from before I mentioned where it was, it was, uh, it had code added that would replace your files with uh, a heart emoji and, and, and basically delete your files. And you can see here, I'll just focus on this line down here where they're basically writing over your files with uh, with this character of, of a heart emoji. Cool. So now you have a sense for kind of the just six of the types of uh, you know TTPs that attackers like to use. Uh, and now I want to I want to spend the last bit of time that we have here, maybe the last five minutes, just talking about like steps you can actually take to protect your app. So um, you know, let's go over just kind of a few things here. So first, I just want to start with what do I think won't work. Um, because there's a lot of red herrings here. I think vulnerability scanning is a red herring. So what I mean by that is, you know, the, the security industry is really, really obsessed with uh, looking for what are called known vulnerabilities. 
Um, and uh, you know, they, they look for those and the, the tools all report you know, how many known vulnerabilities that you have. You've probably seen NPM itself telling you this when you run NPM install, it'll tell you you have 500 packages that have vulnerabilities, right? The truth is that a lot of those vulnerabilities are low uh, impact. They may not even be exploitable by uh, an attacker because they're in a development, they're in a developer tool, they're, they're a dev dependency, so they're not even shipped to production, right? Or, or they're not publicly accessible by a user. So a lot of that stuff is just noise. And um, so that's one thing. The other thing is that a lot of, a lot of times, right? What we're, like the things we're worried about are these supply chain attacks where a package is taken over and, um, and bad code is added. And that is not gonna show up in a known vulnerability report because by definition, no one knows about this. It's supply chain attack yet, right? It's a new attack. So there's not, there's not like a database you can go and look up and say, hey, is this code good or not, right? It's, it's not a thing you can actually do. And so just to be really clear here, there is a very big difference between vulnerabilities and supply chain attacks. And vulnerabilities are a lot easier to solve of a problem, right? They're, they're, they're basically accidentally introduced by a, a maintainer. And if you ship them to production, it's, it's, it can be okay if they're low impact. Uh, you know, a lot of times, right, you, you, you install a package and you find out that you have like hundreds of vulnerabilities and, in, in, you know, an NPM warns you about it. And most of us, we're just ignoring those. And it's mostly fine because most of those are false positives and most of those are not real issues. Now, occasionally there is a really big vulnerability that's really important and it is very, very severe. But um, by and large, a lot of these are noise and they're not, they're not actually um, accessible by, um, by an attacker. On the other hand, a supply chain attack is something that is intentionally introduced by an attacker. So it's not, never, never okay to ship that malware to production, right? The minute you run one of these attack uh, packages, you're in trouble. Like there, you have to basically catch it before you install it or before you depend on it. There's no way to say, oh, this is low impact. I'm gonna ship it uh, to production. It'll be fine. We'll fix it next week, right? You can't do that with the, with the supply chain attack because it's literally a virus. It's literally malware, right? So you have to catch this before you even run it. Um, and so for that reason, it's very different than vulnerabilities. So, so I don't think, you know, it's, it's, if, you're, if you're looking for vulnerabilities, if you're using Dependabot or something like that, that's great, keep doing it, but just know that it's not protecting you from supply chain attacks. And you need to have a different approach for, for, for protecting yourself from those. And that's what we're gonna talk about here. Okay, so a vulnerability scanner will not catch the next supply chain attack. Okay, so what can you actually do to protect your app? So really quickly, I'll just mention, we should be supporting our open source maintainers. 23% um, of open source projects have only one developer contributing almost all the code. So um, we really need to do better here at supporting maintainers and, and, uh, and they will do, then do a better job of taking care of the packages that we use and that we build our businesses on. Um, the second thing we can do is to change how we think about dependencies. So I think right now, a lot of us uh, developers think of you know, our dependencies as kind of not our problem. You know, if there's a bug or a problem in our dependencies, you know, it's, it's not my fault, right? I didn't, I didn't cause the bug. It was, it was the dependency's fault, right? The thing is that it doesn't matter where the attack comes from, whether you typed it in on the keyboard yourself or whether it came in through one of your dependencies. At the end of the day, all that code, your third-party code and your code is all going to get bundled up together into one big file or it's going to run in one big process. And your computer, you know, the process doesn't care who wrote the code. At the end of the day, that's your program. Your program it includes all of your dependencies as well as the code that you wrote. And so you really need to think about your dependencies as your problem, right? They are, they are your problem. It is part of your program. So um, you know, if, you, if, you, if you ship code to production, you are responsible for it, whether you wrote it or not. And if you look at the MIT license, which is the most popular open source license, it even tells you this. It even says it right at the top there. It says the software is provided as is without warranty of any kind, express or implied. So it's telling you there, you know, it's your problem. <laughs> it's not the fault of the package if something goes wrong. Okay, so so look, wait, so now you, you, you've, you've accepted that, that, that you're going to, you need to think about it differently. So now what are you going to do, right? What, what are some things you can actually do here? So, so one thing to think about is, is, is just how often should you update your dependencies, right? What is the right cadence to keep your dependencies up to date? So, you know, a lot of us are using these tools like Dependabot, which will help you keep your dependencies up to date. Uh, and that's great. Um, however, there's some downsides to, to using stuff like that. So let's talk about them. So you can think of the, the pace as kind of a continuum between too slow and too fast. So if you update too slowly, then you're exposing yourself to known vulnerabilities, which are, you know, 
bugs that are basically known by everybody, they're public, and you're running that vulnerable code in production. And so that could be a problem, right? And so that's what something like Dependabot can help you with. It can help you keep up to date and, and, and um, you know, uh, fix, uh, update to new versions that fix those issues, right? Um, however, uh, if, you, if you update too fast, you actually expose yourself to supply chain attacks because, because now, you know, you may be merging a Dependabot PR which is updating you to a version of code that was published, you know, hours ago, right? So if, if, a, if a new package was published literally a couple hours ago and Dependabot is sending you a pull request and telling you, hey, you should update and you, and you accept that update, you're now running code that probably no one has even looked at yet, right? You're running code that literally is, is, is um, you know, is brand new, right? No one has looked at it. No one has seen if there's problems in it. And so that is a great way to expose yourself to supply chain attacks is, is actually updating too quickly. So, what is the right like amount of time to wait? Uh, I honestly don't have a good answer here because as you as I mentioned before, sometimes malware persists for up to two hundred days on uh, or or even that other paper mentioned four hundred days, right? So we obviously can't wait four hundred days and 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 wait that long to to update our dependencies. So we're really in a pickle here. Um, and I don't have a good answer. Um, I've seen some teams will they'll use, they'll use an approach of staying six months behind except for critical security fixes. That's one approach. Um, but, um, but let's keep going here and I ha have maybe have a solution for you um, in the next section. So there's trade-offs and no perfect solution. Okay. So one final thing you can do here is you can really try to dig deeper before you choose a dependency or before you update to a new version of a dependency. And what do I mean by digging deeper? Well, obviously if you had infinite time and infinite uh, money, you could just sort of look at every line of code, right? in all of your dependencies and, and just make sure that none of the lines of code are bad, right? That would be like kind of the gold standard. So obviously most of us can't do this. And so we were faced with the question of how closely should we try to audit our dependencies? So again, I'm gonna think of this like a continuum from full audit to doing nothing. And on the full audit side, you actually see some companies actually do do this. So companies like Google actually do have teams that are designed to, that are, whose whole purpose is to basically audit open source dependencies and then they, um, they, 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 they approve them for use within Google. Um, uh, that's, that's one approach, but it's a lot of work. It's really slow and it's potentially very expensive I mean, in terms of just the amount of, uh, of, of time and resources that it takes to read every, every line of code of every dependency. Um, on the other hand, you can do nothing. And this is what most of us are doing today, unfortunately. Um, if you do nothing, then you're completely vulnerable to supply chain attacks because you're not reading your code. And of course, this is a very risky thing to do because you, know, you might um, you might be installing malware, you might be, be affected by a supply chain attack, and it can be expensive in a different way. It can be expensive in terms of uh, bad PR for your company, or in terms of just sort of uh, amount of, um, uh, of legal fees or 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 or, or um, government penalties for for losing uh, user data. So, really, neither extreme here it seems very very uh, reasonable. So we need to do something kind of in the middle. And what I think the solution here is is something involving automation. So we can use automation to audit our dependencies for us, save us time, and to highlight the riskiest things in our, in our dependencies. And I'll talk about that uh, a little bit more in a second. So as far as like doing an audit, right? Like say you were trying to do a, an audit here um, and you didn't want to use automation, right? You just want to kind of look for a few things. So what are, you, what are you looking for when you try to choose a dependency? Most of us look for, you know, does it get the job done? Does it have an open source license so we're allowed to use it? Does it have good docs? Does it have a lot of downloads and GitHub stars? Does it have recent commits? Does it have types maybe? So you can get auto completion. Um, does it have tests? So these things are pretty easy to check for. You can check for them in a couple of seconds, just going to the GitHub repo. Um, and hopefully you're checking for some of these things before you choose a dependency. If you're not, this is pretty easy to start doing. Um, but really, I, you know, even if you are looking for these things, I don't think this is really sufficient. Like this is not enough, right? In 2022 with supply chain attacks, this is not gonna get the job done here. In 2022, we really need a different checklist. We need to be asking much more um, serious questions about our dependencies, such as, is this dependency gonna run a shell script when I install it? Is it gonna execute code automatically on my computer, right? Does this dependency have native code? Does it have an executable file that I can't audit because it's been compiled already and, it, and, I, and I can't see the source code for it? Um, does it talk to the network? Because talking to the network means it can send my data to a server, right? Does this package run shell commands or spawn child processes? Does this package read my environment variables? 
does this package gather telemetry or, or um, you know, collect usage data that it sends home, that it phones home? Does it contain obfuscated code, which might be, you know, an attacker hiding code, trying to you know, make it make it not, not stand out, right? And these are the things we should really be looking for in 2022 if we're trying to avoid supply chain attacks and are trying to protect our teams from this, uh, you know, this, this attack vector. Unfortunately, this is actually a lot of work to look for because you actually have to crack open the package and look at, at what, what the code is doing. And so um, this is where Socket can help. So this is the, the tool and the, you know, the company that I'm working on um, with a team of awesome open source maintainers. And um, I'll just share a little bit about it now and uh, give you a taste for how it works because I think this is one potential solution to the problem. So if you go to Socket, you can actually search for packages and look up uh, what we know about them. And we'll actually do a lot of those checks for you that I mentioned on the previous slide. So um, in this example, we're looking up the buffer util package. And you can see here at the top, there's a bunch of scores. Uh, and um, you can see the supply chain security score is actually quite high, it's 89. Um, you, do, you, will, you will notice there's a few things we're calling out here very prominently. So this package is gonna run code automatically upon installation, and it does have native code. Um, but if you, if you click into these alerts here, you can actually see exactly what the install script is gonna do, exactly where the native code is. And in this case, this package actually turns out to be uh, totally safe. It's not a problem at all. But we are, we are letting you know about these risky things that it is doing here and giving you the information that you need as a developer to determine if this package is safe. Okay, so this is a good example, but now what about a package that's doing something a little bit more sketchy, right? So this is a different package. This is actually a quite a, a popular React component that shows a loading spinner overlay on your website. And it's, it's, it's really quite, quite a popular package. You can see it has 83,000 um, yearly downloads. But you'll notice that the supply chain security score is quite a bit lower than the last package. It's only 56. And you see that we found some pretty critical issues in the dependencies of this package. So Socket actually doesn't just scan the package itself, it actually scans all of the package's dependencies and their dependencies and their dependencies all the way down. So we'll catch any issue that might be hiding in there. And so if you click in there, you can actually see what, what did we find in the dependencies of this package. And the two, the two most prominent things here you'll notice is it has an install script and it has telemetry. And the, the telemetry actually turns out to be sending data about your computer back to the maintainer of the package. It sends things like your IP address, and the name of your project and your Git remote URL. So like, what is the URL of your Git project and stuff like that. And so this is, you know, it's not, I would say this is not malware, but it's pretty sketchy and it's probably not something that you want your packages to be doing. And so what we can do is tell you that it's happening and tell you how to opt out of it. So that's what Socket's doing here. Finally, let's look at, look at a piece of malware. So this is actually outright malware. This is a package that is that has been removed from NPM. It's 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 it was it was actually malicious, um, and you can see what did Socket um, report on this package. So of course we gave it a score of zero because it's malware. Um, and if you look through the, the list of issues that we detected, there's a whole bunch. It actually scrolls off the bottom of the page here. Um, we detect install scripts. We detect that it accesses the network, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And you can click into any of these and see exactly the line of code where it does that uh, particular uh, behavior. So if we click in here, you can see. Um, on this line of code where the package is actually accessing your environment variables. And then you can see down here, it actually sends them off to a server with an HTTP request. Uh, so we, we caught kind of, we caught the bad behavior right there. And you can see exactly that it was doing, it's stealing your environment variables, stealing your tokens. And so this is one way you can use Socket to be, um, to, 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 to do research on packages before you use them and to get a sense for if they're safe or not for your team to be using, right? However, if you don't remember to do this, then you might still be vulnerable, right? You might forget to do it one time or someone on your team might not remember to check socket. And so what you really wanna do is use some kind of automation here to monitor your dependency changes. And um, I recommend you try to monitor your PRs for bad dependencies by, by really analyzing every PR and looking at every new dependency or new version that's being added and looking for when new APIs are being used that are privileged or when new obfuscated code is being introduced or, or any other signals that are, that are there. Um, and then when you find something suspicious, you should dig in and try to answer any questions about it. Like, why is this package doing this? Right? What can I do? What, 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 why, is it, why is it behaving in this way? Like, does it doesn't make sense for the package to be doing this. Um, and, and then to put that information directly into PRs so developers can see it and act on it. And of course, Socket has a solution to this for this. So if you go to socket.dev here, you can actually, you can get this behavior pretty, pretty much in a couple of clicks by just installing our GitHub app. It takes a couple minutes to do, and it's totally free. Um, 
So when you do that, what you'll actually get is uh, you'll get this bot that can leave comments on your pull requests anytime it detects a suspicious dependency. And so in this screenshot here, what you can see is Sockets actually detected that the user, had, the developer has installed the wrong package. They've actually installed the package Bowserify instead of Browserify. So I missed the letter R here. And Browserify is actually downloaded 172,000 times more than uh, Bowserify, which is a totally you know, unused um, package really. And so we can basically warn the developer that, hey, you probably didn't mean to install this, this package and it's probably not what you wanted to, intended to install. So um, in this case, the developer can see this alert and can fix the problem before um, any, any you know, security incident happens. So it's pretty handy. Here's another example where we detected that a package has telemetry. So in this case, you can see that Next.js gathers a bit of telemetry about um, how you use the, the package. And if you'd like to opt out of that, we provide the helpful instructions here that tell you exactly what environment variable you need to set to opt out of Next.js gathering telemetry. Um, so those are the main things you can do. And then finally, I just threw in this section here, which is just a few ideas for how JavaScript can improve the language to make these types of issues better in the future. So this is kind of advanced stuff, um, but I really think that if we do this as a community that we can actually get to a much safer place. So I'm just gonna throw these in here. This is kind of my JavaScript security wish list. So the first one is I really think that we need to um, cut down on the number of, of warnings that you see when you run NPM install. There's just too many of those. There's hundreds of those. And so we need a way for maintainers to be able to suppress those and reduce the number. Um, finally, our, uh, additionally, we need uh, something like Deno's uh, permission model. If any of you have used Deno, it's, it's, um, it has this cool feature where you can run a program and, and give it a explicit uh, permission to use the network or to use other permissions. Um, I think something like that would, would really be quite helpful and nice to have a node. And finally, there's um, some language uh, features that are being proposed for ECMAScript that could really help us lock down the permissions of individual packages. Um, cool, so, so those are my suggestions for you. Um, you know, I, I really think probably the easiest thing to do is to just go and install Socket from socket.dev. But um, you know, there's, there's a lot of other things you can do, uh, such as, you know, like I mentioned, just sort of changing your mindset around dependencies, being a little bit more careful, doing a little bit more research, uh, maybe reading the code for one or two of your dependencies that have seemed particularly risky. And just kind of like treating this as a serious problem that you're, that you're trying to address. Um, so uh, with, with that, um, I think I'll, um, I'll end here and I'll just say thanks for having me. And if you want to uh, get in contact to ask me any questions or, um, or, or follow up in any way, um, you can contact me on Twitter. There's my, my URL and my email is there as well. And um, you can check out socket at socket.dev. And um, just a quick shout out is we're hiring. So if you're interested in working on, um, on this product with us, uh, hit me up and uh, we can chat. Cool. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. Um, that was great. I think, um, yeah, we, we encounter just along like the error monitoring kind of use case, just like being more proactive and um, not letting like the stream of depend upon uh, notifications be ignored, like really actually be more proactive. Um, so that was, that was really interesting. The, the other thing I saw is just like those examples are far less advanced than you'd think, I think. Like, yeah. I think they're, once you like get into the, I think I've seen a lot of other examples too, but I think once you get into this mindset and process, like it is actually pretty easy to go like identify this stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Once once you, you know, start to look into things and do some of this more proactive kind of monitoring you were talking about. Um, Absolutely, yeah. Cool. And, and yeah, I, I guess, uh, unless anyone else had any questions, my, my only question was really like on that last slide, um, do you think like in terms of improving this kind of chaos, I mean, obviously like solutions like Socket are, are huge. Um, do you think like NPM just changes there and like how do you work, do you work with NPM in terms of like proactively alerting them? Like we think we've got something here. Um, is mm -hmm. it NPM or is it Node that needs to kind of be worked on to, to try to solve this issue? Or is it new stuff like Bun or, or Deno that is gonna just bundle a lot of this stuff in by default? And like, yeah, where do you think in the, the greater kind of scheme of things, like the greater community, the most impactful stuff can happen? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, you know, when we find something, we do tell NPM about it. Um, we're, we're currently working on scaling up our uh, processing pipeline so we can actually analyze every package on NPM as it's wow. going, you know, as it's, as it's getting published. So that's something that we think is going to really help uh, us catch more of this stuff in the future. Um, 
But NPM does have their own um, process where they actually do look for malware inside of uh, packages that are published, but they're looking for stuff that's like mostly similar to, as far as I know, it's not public, but you know, it, 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 from what I've heard, they, they're sort of looking for stuff that looks like other malware that they've caught before. And so it's not a very good process for whatever reason. It doesn't really catch, uh, catch a lot of the stuff. Like, you know, we still see the headlines in the news about this stuff. So they're just not, they're not proactively catching it. It seems like it's a very reactive process and they're missing a lot of stuff, right? So I know it's something that they care about, but just for whatever reason, it's not been the thing that they, they've been able to do a good job of so far. And then on top of that, you know, there's also also other ecosystems that we're planning to expand into, like Python, Ruby, Rust, Go, you know, Java, and these other ecosystems. A lot of them have um, package registries which don't have big corporations behind them. Like you know, npm has GitHub behind it, and Microsoft owns GitHub, and so they have you know a lot of resources. But a lot of other communities actually their registries are just run as a as a volunteer service, and there's they just accept donations to keep it to keep the lights on. And so for those um, communities, it's actually even harder for them to do proactive. Um, malware detection and to try to catch this stuff. So I think there's going to be a space for Socket to help out, um, you know, even if NPM gets their act together on this front. Um, and I know I do know they, they do care about it. Um, I think another thing that we can do to help with this is, um, you know, um, uh, the language level stuff. Like like I mentioned here, the, these, these, these proposals here, I, I, I think, you know, there's, it would be amazing if we could get to a place where every package has to upfront declare what permissions it needs or what it needs to, to, to function correctly so that when you go to install it, you can actually see almost like a smartphone app. You know, these are the yeah. permissions that this this dependency is going to use. And if they don't make sense or they, they seem ridiculous, you can, you know, reject it right there up front. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then it can be enforced by the runtime. So, you know, this is something that I think probably should should be done by the language more than by like bun or by node or by any particular runtime it should be i think it should be a thing that's just built into the language as a right. core feature but, which is like let me yeah. run this code in like a jail or in a sandbox right right so like down yeah. per function per file whatever kind of basis or yeah okay yeah that makes sense exactly um we did get one question from Holker. uh yeah why aren't all commits of open source projects signed with like pgp for instance um that that's a good question. A I mean, security problems. So some some uh, package managers do um, sign the releases, not necessarily the commits, but they sign the the release artifacts. Um, and I think that that is a good idea. Um, NPM should probably support that. Uh, and they've, it's been on their to do list for like a long time now. But if if you if you think about if you think back to some of the attacks we discussed in this talk, there's a lot of of uh, them that wouldn't be helped by signing, right? So yep. for example. A maintainer going rogue and putting malware into their own package would not be, you know, th that would not be stopped by, um, ha by having the packages be signed because the attacker in that case is the maintainer, right? They are the one who has the signing key. Um, there's also, you know, things like the maintainer getting malware on their own laptop and then some attacker being able to steal the keys and, and use the keys that way, right? Um, so, and there's the protest examples. And so, yeah, and then there's examples of telemetry where you might not want that data to be gathered because it's against your company policy, um, but that's being inserted by the maintainer. And so, you know, I do think signing helps, but it just it doesn't fully solve the problem by any means. It's not a silver bullet. Um, we should probably just do it because it, it helps with a few things. But um, but overall, we, we really do need to either read the code ourselves or use a tool that helps us catch when the code is doing something suspicious that merits a second look with human human eyes, right? Awesome. Um, that looks like all the questions. This was this was great. I'm gonna go cool. stare at a bend a pot now. <laughs> um, awesome. You should go uh, yeah. install. You should install. You should install socket. No, <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna go do. try it out. Um, <laughs> cool. Yeah, the recording will be sent around. Um, and yeah, reach out. If anyone has any questions? Thanks. Yeah, feel feel free to reach out. Yeah, thanks for having me, Luke. Uh, and um, everyone, have a good rest of your day. Thanks for having me. See ya. See ya.